Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Karen. I'm an alcoholic. Um, thank you, Jill, and everyone that um, does service, Angelus. Thank you for asking me to come along and share. It's a privilege and it's an honour to be asked to do service. And um, I only found out yesterday that the meeting's actually based in Hendon, but I've got my niece here for Easter, so um, I didn't really want to leave her. So a shout out to a few people that I, that I know in the room there. <laughs> it's not. It's nice to. It's nice to see friendly faces and nice to um, meet people that I haven't met before. And um, yeah, it's a long time to share. So um, I, I put my timer on, and I don't know when I get started. Sometimes um, I can't stop, and if if um, you know, I, I'll keep an eye on the time anyway. And um, if anybody's new to the fellowship, like, welcome. Like, you know, it's um, it's a really scary place to come into. I found it a very scary place. You know, I always say that it was like, you know, the first day at school, walking into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I um, was absolutely broken, like, you know, a lot of you can relate to. And... Um, you know, a lot of my beliefs that I had, like, in my first few years, I don't believe them now. Like, you know, I had this belief system that, you know, everybody in the rooms was, you know, like, all friends and, you know, nobody was going to like me. And, you know, I was just baffled that I ended up where I ended up, really, even with the wreckage of my past and I'm I don't know if you're new and you've come in and you've, you know, fallen in a bush and lost your mobile phone and you're here or, you know, welcome. It's not a competition here of who's got, you know, the worst story. But unfortunately, you know, for me, um, you know, I found my rock bottom and it had a trap door and I went down and then I got a shovel and I started digging. You know, I will keep it to Alcoholics Anonymous, but I am an addict as well. I'm actually an addict in many different areas of my life. And this is why one of the reasons I picked, you know, the reconstruction of like my side of the street, you know, that's because as I found out by being in the fellowship for, you know, a number of years, I've got a lot of underlying issues, you know, but first I had to learn, you know, how not to drink one day at a time. And, um, you know, it. I was terrified coming into the rooms, terrified. You know, I was somebody that didn't share for two and a half years. I went in and out of the rooms first for two and a half years. I didn't share for two and a half years. You know, if you met me on the street when I was in the madness, you probably would have walked on the other side of the road. But I came in here and my coping mechanisms and what I had been doing for so long you know, had been stripped away from me. So I didn't know how to be. I didn't know how to act. I didn't know how to socially interact with people. You know, I could t- I could tell you how to rob, steal, be manipulate. I could tell you how to work and, and sign on. I could tell you how to dodge this, you know, all, all the, you know, not paying your TV license, the list goes on. You know, I could tell you all that, but I couldn't tell you how to live. And I didn't understand that. I didn't understand that. You know, I struggled, you know, with responsibility. I struggled with the person I was. I struggled with my identity as a woman. You know, I had a belief system that, you know, um, other women had the book of life, that they were able to, you know, pick the right man, act in the correct manner, you know, conduct themselves. And and years were going past and I saw my friends settling down and getting, you know, good jobs or getting further education and, and getting married. And I was, you know, 
in a pub in the early days in raves, you know, um, completely lost and thinking I was having a good time, you know, really thinking and that, you know, I was free, you know, I was free to do whatever I wanted to do. And, you know, it has been a long road of reconstruction for me. You know, I've had a belief system as well that I sort of come in and a bit of fairy dust would be put on me and, you know, I'd meet a nice fella and, you know, go off into the sunset and be rescued in that castle and, you know, all, I, all the outside things, all the, the, you know, if only I had this, I'd be all right. If only, you know, I had money I'd be all right if only I had someone to look after me I'd be all right and um you know I had to realize that it really is an inside job and the things that I share you know if you're new I used to roll my eyes at people when I came in here because I just thought it's just a this is where dinosaurs come to die you know I was 38 years of age and I thought this is where dinosaurs come to die you know, I, how am I? I'm such a loser that I've ended up in these rooms. And I never realised that by sitting on a chair of Alcoholics Anonymous, my life was going to change. I didn't realise by sitting on a chair of Alcoholics Anonymous, it was going to be the best thing that I ever done in my life. You know, and my, my life has gone from night to day, you know, and, and it's all... Um, care of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, when I came into the fellowship, you know, I really didn't have anything through my alcoholism and my other things. I ended up, you know, losing everything, but I didn't really have anything to lose. You know, um, I ended up in a, looking at a prison sentence. I was um, living in a homeless hostel in Harlesden in London. I, um, you know, was unlovable, unemployable, you know, you wouldn't trust me to run a bath, you know, I, I, you know, I just, but I had plenty of bunny, you know, I had plenty of talk and I'd learned like that I could manipulate people and like, especially men, you know, that I could have the poor story about myself. And, you know, I hear a lot of stuff in the rooms you know, that I don't agree with, and that's okay, and you'll probably not agree with a lot of things that I say, but I've had to do a lot of soul searching in here. I've had to do a lot of digging. I've had to do a lot of step work. I've had to go to other fellowships. I've had to really meet myself, you know, and I had beautiful people put in my path, you know, and, you know, look out for those people that are putting their hand out to you if you're new, saying, let me help you, you know, because I had too much pride to sit in front of a, another woman and say, this is me. Do you know what I mean? This is me. I'm full of shame of the stuff that I'd done. I thought I was the only woman in the rooms that had done, behaved the way that I did, you know. Um, and what I realised, you know, is that I've got some stiff competition in here that, <laughs> you know, we're all... We're all, we've all done the same thing with a different face on a different occasion. And I'm not special and different. I'm just a garden variety alcoholic. And, you know, if you believe you were born an alcoholic, that's fantastic. That's brilliant. You know, one size doesn't fit, fit all. But I know I wasn't born an alcoholic. I just know I wasn't. You know, I was born pure. I was born, you know, uh, as a God's child. And it was my, for me, and I'm not, please don't, you know, if you're new, think, you know, this is, this is my opinion. This isn't the words of Alcoholics Anonymous. Even though Bill W knew there was something more wrong because of the way that he wrote the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the way that he wrote the 12 by 12 when he was struggling at 15 years sober, he knew that there was more. He knew that it wasn't just the booze. You know, he knew, you know, and, you know, I'm so grateful to the founders of this fellowship. But, but you know, his behaviour is no different to my own sometimes. And he, you know, he, it's the hand of God. This programme is the hand of God, you know. And I've had to realise that I've been conditioned 
by this belief system. So my belief system is all my life that everybody over there knows what they're doing. You know, everybody knows what they're doing. Everybody, you know, can uh, have a drink and do whatever and they can hold their life together, that they make the right decisions. My, you know, I'm a bad picker. You know, that's my problem. Like, I'm not very good at picking men. I'm a bad picker. And, you know, and I haven't got very good education because my parents came over from Ireland and they didn't have nothing. And my my mum didn't know how to read and write. My mum still today, my mum self-taught herself, you know. So I didn't have that nourish support. I didn't come from the worst childhood, but I came from a place where... You know, my parents were out working all the time and we had to grow up fast. You know, I used to walk to school with my brother. You know, I was four, my brother was seven and my brother had a key around his neck and we used to come home from school and there was nobody here, you know, and we had to fend for ourselves. And, you know, and there was a lot of going on. You know, my parents had freedom coming over from Ireland And it's not a sob story, it's a fact. You know, it's a fact that I've had to meet that and I've had to come to terms with that and I've had to understand that, you know, my mum never said once or my dad, you know what, I think I'm going to mess my daughter's head up. they done what they had to do with what they had and they had nothing. My parents were living in Kilburn. They were living in a two-bedroom, sorry, a two-room flat you know, and they had a broken window. I remember as a child, there's some memories. I don't have loads of memories. I remember my dad trying to fix the window and they had, you know, with wood, putting it up and we had nothing, you know, and and that was the way it was. And they loved us as much as they could, but but it it just was the circumstances. So I learned from a very early age that adults never knew best. You know, they didn't know best. And I knew that I had to fend for myself, which I did. So I piled around with people that were in the same situation as me. There was other kids in the neighbourhood, you know, and it was just how it was. And we were out, we were doing all sorts of stuff, you know, and... You know, we were on the old Tipex thinner and gas and children. And I'm talking 11 years of age. So 11 years of age, I was not happy in my own skin. You know, I wasn't happy being Karen. I couldn't accept being Karen because I would otherwise want you to be my friend and go over the top because I'm a great codependent, you know, or I would try and buy you. I'd rob off my parents and all that sort of stuff that goes with like low self-esteem and low and low self-worth and I've got a couple of sort of like wounds for me in my life you know and one of them was like my mum was having an affair with the next door neighbor you know and she used to bring him she used to bring him into the house you know and I was told to shh you know so I knew, I knew very early on how to how to keep secrets you know I knew how to keep secrets And I knew I could see things around me and it wasn't matching up with the parenting that I was trying to get, you know. And so how I done it was I escaped out. So I stayed at other people's houses, didn't want to come home and all that. So that was one um, difficult um, uh, incident for me. Another that is that my dad had a heart attack when I was 14 years of age. And he left the house in an ambulance and he never came home. He didn't die, but he never came home. So, you know, childhood trauma is your parents splitting up. That is a is is what divorce is. If you're a young person and your parents split up, that is childhood trauma. So that was another thing for me. And um, the, the last one was the sort of catalyst, really, was, was my schooling. Because I didn't realise I had dyslexia. And I could see other people concentrating at school and getting the support and getting the marks. And the only way I knew that I could get attention was bad attention. So I acted out in school. I was a class clown, you know, all this. And this all affected my well-being and my sense of self. I had no 
sense of who I was, what I wanted to do. You know, and when you say to children, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, the best thing is I want to be happy. You know, I want to be whole. I want to be me. I want to be happy with myself. Just didn't know what I wanted. And I stood up in school. It was actually, I've learned everything from members in this fellowship, from listening, from going to meetings. I've never had a holiday from the meeting. I'm a somebody that does a lot of meetings, helps a lot of people. I've always had a sponsor. I've always helped people, you know, and I went to a meeting. There's a meeting in Golders Green, and it's one of the oldest meetings in the country. And there's a guy in there, and, I, and I'm not breaking his anonymity because I've asked him and he doesn't mind me sharing him. His name is Suntan John, and he's got a suntan all year round. And I don't know if he's got a sunbed in his house, but he's like, he must be about 80 years of age and he looks like he's about 40. <laughs> he looks great. And he, he, I went to the meeting in Golders Green, you know, and, and he said to me, you know, you've been coming in and out of this fellowship, Karen. He said, why don't you get a commitment? And I just thought, you know what, I'd rather die than get a commitment at this meeting because I should be down in Chelsea or somewhere. I shouldn't be up in Golders Green. And you know what? You never know that one line that someone will say to you and it will change your life. And he looked into my eyes and he said to me, Karen, if you take this tea commitment, it will change your life. You know, and I'm telling you, it makes me really upset because he was right. That tea commitment changed my life. You know, I, I had four kettles. I mean, I think there's packs in the meeting, in the live meeting. He... Like not a, not a lot of people remember me from the early days, but he probably does. And I was like a mad woman. I had an array of biscuits that you could that would have more than Tesco's. You know, I had kettles on the boil. There was never not any hot water. You know, never scared of any hot water. And I thought, how is this all going to help me? Like being in a meeting with a bunch of old timers. And I sat with sometime John once, and I said to he said to him, "Why don't you read in the meeting?" I said, I can't read. I'm not a very good reader. And he said, did something happen to you at school? I said, I said, yeah. I said, when I was 14 years of age, and this is the last trauma, I stood up in the class to read something and I didn't want to, but I felt forced and I thought I didn't want to be seen because years ago you were known as, you was, you know, known as the thick child. You wasn't like you've got a disability or anything like that. And I said a word wrong, you know, and the class laughed at me and the teacher sniggered at me. And I'm telling you, that smile on my teacher's face, I can still see it today. And I kicked over the table and I walked out that school and I picked a brick up. There was a broken wall outside the school and I picked a brick up at 14 years of age and I threw it through the school window and I said, I'll show you. I'll show you. I'm never coming back to this school again. That school never sent a letter home to see where I was. That, you know, it was just like rejection after rejection of not being wanted, didn't want to be wanted at home, wasn't for the school, you know, trying to do this with friends. And this is the sort of system that I went through in my life. And my inner critic was, you, you know, you're just, you're not good enough. You're just like, you know, you, it, life's not for you, Karen. You know, and the only thing I could do to take away that was drink. You know, drink was a great anesthetic for me. You know, it took away everything. The minute I took that first drink, I was nailed to the bar. You know, I was an alcoholic. There was no progression for me. I drank and I drank and I stayed out for days and I done things with people places and things that today like I have got compassion for that girl today I've got total love for what I put myself through and I went through life like the tornado it talks about in the big book you know I went through life and settling for crumbs in relationship putting up with unacceptable behavior you know, not loving myself, not nurturing myself, not having any respect for myself. And I fueled it with drink. I fueled it with 
I just wanted to party. I was the girl that was on your sofa three days later thinking, will she ever go home? Will she ever go home? There was nothing enough of anyone. And I guarantee you, and you probably could say the same about yourself, I love alcohol more than anyone on this meeting. And you could probably say it about yourself. You know, what it done is it gave me wings and then it took away the sky. That's what it done, you know. And there's an old timer up in Leeds and he said, alcohol done for him what the phone box done for Clark Kent. And I get that. It made me Wonder Woman, you know. It just rocketed me to the fourth dimension. And I found like-minded people and I just went through my life. And it was like a blur. It's like, it's like I woke up in Alcoholics Anonymous at 38 years of age thinking, what happened to me? You know, and I ended up in a homeless hostel, you know, in trouble with the police and doing all sorts, not working. And my first port of call to recovery was my health. You know, I ended up collapsing one day and I had contracted something very similar to coronavirus. I contracted swine flu, you know, and because I had no immune system, I'd shattered my immune system. I wasn't drinking, I wasn't um, eating, I wasn't looking after myself, I wasn't washing, I wasn't washing my clothes, I wasn't doing anything. I was lost, I was afraid, uh, you know, and I just was with other like-minded people like me that didn't judge me because they were all in the same boat. We were all just a bunch of lost children running around trying to find where we could get the next drink from, you know, and I ended up <clears throat> being brought into hospital and I got very, very seriously ill. You know, I ended up um, ended up on a life support machine. You know, I had my last rites, was in a hospital for five and a half months. And the insanity was when I came out of that hospital, I drank. I drank. If you've been on a life support machine because of your drinking and I drank, you know, and my life went on. And when I was in the hospital, the, the surgeon said to me, to my mum, actually, as your daughter, because I hadn't spoken to my mum for nearly two years before I came into the rooms, before, sorry, before I went into hospital. And they said, has your daughter got a drink problem? And my mum went, shh, shh. Because if you said anything about my drinking, you were removed because I would not put up with people questioning me about my behaviour because I would back something back at them. But that was like my first God conscience. That was my first sign from my higher power. They had sent an angel to say to me, you know, have you the first professional person that questioned me about my drink? And in the hostel, there was a sign for a drug and alcohol unit. And one day I walked in there and I was screaming, please, someone help me. And they induced, introduced me to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and I got a sponsor and I lied to them. They said to me, write a gratitude list. I joined a, a WhatsApp group. I used to copy and paste everyone else's gratitude list. Very good tip if you're new here. You know, copy and pasted other people's gratitude lists, you know, and uh, that's a joke, by the way, and, and, and sent it to my, you know, to my sponsor, looking for the easiest, softer way than not do this program. And for me, it was shame. It was shame of who I was. And I didn't want to sit in front of another human being and show myself to them, you know, and I was going in and out of the rooms getting commitments, not turning up, you know, and eventually I got that gift of desperation, you know, and, you know, and there was, I don't know if you're new and someone that's coming in and out of these rooms, I don't know why some people get this and some people don't. I mean, I had to have that complete and that a gift of desperation where I was so broken I was lying on the floor screaming to God. And it wasn't 999, God, get me out of here. It was screaming to God, please help me. You know, and that night I invited a loving higher power into my life that I choose to call God that doesn't want me in recovery to eat the fridge, doesn't want me to be the codependent, doesn't want me to be dishonest, doesn't want me, you know, 
putting up with unacceptable behavior wants me to be whole and wants me to be thyself be true my sponsor used to say you see the chip you pick it up and put it in your hand and you read what it says to you it says to thyself be true you know and it also tells us in our literature you know that we do not let you know we're not doormats here you know it talks about i think it's interaction or um it's, it uh i think it's into it doesn't really matter where it is but it and it talks about it it took you know and and that's what i had done you know and i found a sponsor she was a nurse she was 23 years sober and what she done is she gave me her time that's the precious most precious thing you'll give anybody in your life is your time you know she gave me my time i can't try and give my time to others and time to my family you know and I started going to her house every week and she said to me, Karen, you can't recover from something you don't understand. And if you'll keep on picking up a drink, Karen, you don't know what you're living with. You don't know what you're living with if you're, if you're drinking because you are living with something that wants you dead. You are living with something that doesn't want you to believe in yourself, doesn't want you to have things for yourself. And I used to think in my head, this is a load of rubbish. I've never heard they're brainwashing me. They've never, I've never heard anything like this, but there was something about this woman. She didn't bat down the program down my throat. She was, she just spoke to me and she was kind, you know, and I started going through the program of recovery for her and the big book might as well have been a Mandarin. You know, I didn't understand it, but I just done it. You know, I had no clue, even at step 12, you know, I didn't have, Really, like, I was sober, you know, I'd done the steps, but I still didn't really, like, understand, you know, and this is where the reconstruction comes ahead because it was a lot of soul searching and a lot of digging, and I joined a big book study, and I was fascinated by this girl taking the big book study. She was confident, you know, she was true to what she said. She had integrity, you know, she was kind, she was loving, she had all the things that I wanted in my life. And, you know, and I started doing this study and I started seeing, she, and I, she started teaching me things. And she said to me, Karen, you know, you're powerless over alcohol. Well, what does your life mean that it's unmanageable? And I'd say, well, it's unmanageable because I'm unemployable. I can't find a boyfriend. I can't, you know, get a job. And she said, it means all that, Karen. But it's the unmanageability of your mind. It's the unmanageability of your emotions. You know, it's your actions. It's what you react to. You know, that is what you're unmanageable about. You know, and she saw it and, you know, and I learned so much from it. And she said, you know, she used to teach me. She said to me, you know, when something comes up, you take inventory. But if you're somewhere you can't, think of it in your step one, two, one, two and three. You know, you're powerless over the situation. It's making your life unmanageable. You're insane to think that you can do anything about it. You're insane to think that you can maybe, you know, um, change the situation by using your defects of character. And she said, and you've got to give it to God. Because this program is about finding a God within you or a, a God of religion or what, of not religion, of you know, believing in the universe or whatever the thing is, just not believing that, you know, I have the answers. And for me, you know, it was it was so, you know, um, soothing or to know that there was something out there looking out after me, you know. And when I'd done my step four, you know, the first time I'd done my step four, I'd done it to the best of my ability. But when I was in that big book study, you know, she was getting me, to really look at and look at my defects of character. Sorry, the dogs are barking at someone outside. Looking at my defects of character, really looking at my part in it and talking through, not just reading the step four out, but really thinking about it and thinking about what was my thinking and why do you think I'd done that? And, you know, what, what was my thought process? And I started really, like, getting into it and really, like enjoying looking at myself which I didn't do the first time around and and she started talking about the defects of ca character you know they're the engine room Karen they're running your engine room like what is your top defects of character well mine is fear fear of fitting in 
fear of what people think of me, you know, fear of not getting what I think I want, not giving what I, what I deserve, you know. And it's like, if I'm living in the moment right here, right now, everything's all right. I'm in a meeting, I'm with everybody, I've got a roof over my head, I've got a bit of money in my pocket, I don't want to drink, I'm doing my recovery, I've got a sponsor that I can ring to, I've got prayer, I've got a beautiful people around me, you know, I'm in a relationship with somebody, you know, I have all this toolbox that I have, but if I'm in the past, which I've always in, you know, I'm in resentment, I'm in regret, I'm in shame, I'm in guilt, I mean, what, you know, what the why should have, could have, you know, or should have. And if I'm in the future, you know, I'm projecting, I'm in fear, you know, I'm trying to control, I'm trying to run the show, I think I know best, you know. And she said, it's about living in the here and now, right here, right now, you know. And if you're in those defects of character and they're running the show, You've got to give them to God, which is your step seven. This is where you fall short. And you fall short if you're living in your sex, even your a step seven, and you're not doing anything about it. You know, you're not, you're not putting the action in, you know. And I was able to make in a list, you know, of of um the people from my step four and other people I didn't have resentments with, you know, and I wrote columns out, yes, no, and maybe, you know, and and, you know, I had this rucksack of beliefs and this rucksack of resentments. And slowly by slowly, I started taking the things out of the rucksack and I started feeling a bit lighter. And I was like, because I wasn't really terrified of step four. I was terrified of step nine. Like, I didn't want to say sorry to anybody because it was like, well, they done this to me. And this guy done this to me. And this friend done this to me. And my parents done that to me. So why should I say sorry? You know, I couldn't take responsibility. I didn't realise it was about clearing my side of the street. I didn't realise that the more that I can can give to God and the more I can take responsibility, the freer that I will be, you know. And I was able to do that in in my step nine. You know, massive amends to my mother because even though the turbulent relationship I had, that woman used to drive around the streets trying to find me. And when she find me, I've got a strong Irish mother. She'd be screaming in the car to get in the car. And when I'd get in there and she'd bring me home and make me all well again, I used to rob her. I used to rob her jewellery, go and pawn it. And she'd ring me and go, Karen, like, what happened to that ring on the side? I'd say, I don't know. I'll come and help you look for it. That's what the step showed me. The step showed me when I pick up a drink, I'm a liability. I'm a liar. I don't care about anyone. I'm selfish and self-centered. The only person that is important is me. I don't think of anybody else. Don't care about anybody else's needs. I don't think about the, you know, the human race being a good member of society. You know, kindness. Kindness is, you know, if the world was kinder, it would be a better place. You know, and I was part, I was part of the problem. You know, and then I and I and I try and live in 10 and 11 and 12. You know, infantry is so important. When I first came in, my sponsor would never take a resentment off me, not unless I wrote it out. She'd say, have you written it out? And I'd say, no, she'd write me, write it out and ring me back. You know, I have books and books and books of infantry. I don't do it so much now. And it's one thing really I need to get back to. I do do it, but not like I did when I first came in. You know, and and my step 11, you know, the power of prayer and being connected. The biggest gift that I've been given in these rooms is the power of prayer. You know, I pray all the time. I connect with God in the morning. You know, my prayers are just for for me and my, and I talk to God like my God is my friend. I say, please, God, help me. Before I started sharing, I said, please, God, you know, help my words. Let me help one person on this meeting. Please take away my fear because that's my top defect is fear. You know, fear is fear is, you know, and it talks about in the literature, I'm riddled with fear. And even when I'm in other defects like dishonesty, behind dishonesty is from fear. When I'm in anger, what's behind anger is fear. When I'm in control and I'm trying to control the situation, it's fear. You know, it's all based back to fear. 
you know, and in my step 12, I try and help others, you know, and I've been given, you know, the absolute privilege of being able to help other women. And because I was so, you know, love doing that big book study so much, I started doing big book studies, you know, and I'd done them in my house for six years, you know, in my house. And then I started doing them on Zoom, you know, and 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 I've learned more from helping other people than I've ever done myself. I've never gone home and think, oh, I'll open up the big book and I think I'll read a few pages. No, I've learned it from helping other women and saying, you are me. I don't shame anybody that I help. I never give them any advice. I've never given a sponsor any advice. I just help them look at, um, you know, look at the situation, you know, and there's another guy in that gold is green meeting, you know, and he used to say to me, Karen, a sponsor is like a fly on the wall and he can see up or she can see up above you and can see down on the situation. And if you don't have your wingman there, you've got no one to run your thinking by. They hold the torch and they turn it on. And they help you. You know, if I've got a sponsor and I'm not connecting with them and I say, yeah, I've got a sponsor, but I'm not ringing them. That's not a sponsor to me. For me, anyway, it might work for other people. Because if I don't give the sponsor all the pieces of my jigsaw and I'm only giving them a couple of pieces, they can't help me because they can't help me form a picture. They can't help me to see what's going on for me. You know, and where has it come from? And and what I and why I, I picked the reconstruction is I started sort of like instead of just thinking things were the way that they were, I started thinking like, why am I bothered by this person? Or why am I reacting to this? Or why is it that when I get in a relationship with someone, I love them so much that they better run? You know, if I love you, you better run because no one is gonna ever love you like I love you because I, you can't leave me. So I've got to prove myself. So I've got to be the perfect girlfriend and be the perfect way and look the perfect way. Because if you leave me, that's how it defines me, you know, and that's how I felt about it. And then if I hate you, you know, you better sleep with one eye open. There was all this extreme behavior, you know, there was no balance. And, and, and I started thinking, why is it like, why am I being affected by this person, you know, and I started going into other fellowships. I started doing 12 by 12, you know, workshops and other big book studies and listening to, you know, like uh, Joe and Charlie. And there's a fantastic speaker, Mark Houston, and he does a thing called the theater step four. If you ever get a chance, Google it on YouTube. It's absolutely fantastic. And he talks about step four, like I've never heard anyone talk about it. And what he does is it's just incredible. He brings people up on the stage and he says, look, can someone bring up a resentment? And this woman came up and said, my husband had an affair with someone and left. And he said, well, this is a juicy resentment and people are giggling. And And what he does is, He uses the people, he pulls up people from the crowd and he uses that to play the woman, but in different roles. So he says, right, tell me about it. Well, she used to work with him. So he let one of the women play a worker. He said, right, pay the mother, you know, play the AA member. And they played it out and they showed you how intense and powerful resentments are because we don't just look at them straight on. We look at them that the character that we're playing, you know, so if I'm hurt, is it hurting me financially? Is it hurting because I'm a girlfriend? Is it hurting me because I'm an AA member? Is it hurting me? You know, and, and it was, and I, I started learning so much, you know, and for me, you know, I went into adult child of alcoholics and dysfunctional families and it changed my life. It absolutely, I could get forgiveness I could see that I was a broken child that was lost and that didn't have any sense of, you know, responsibility or how to keep her house clean or, you know, what was good for me because everything was for everyone else, you know, that I'll I'll never be able to have a relationship because I'm never going to be able to trust anyone because I've been rejected all my life or I'm not the, the girls that in the meetings, they don't really like me because they think I'm too, I've got, I'm too loud or, 
you know i've used i use humor a lot to hide behind so i use humor and the and the list went on and i started seeing the good inside of myself and i started saying actually karen you're a good woman you're kind you're generous you're funny you know you you help people you know you, why not you instead of saying why not you i started saying why why you know what why can't i have nice things you know and everything i own today should have a stamp on it from alcoholics anonymous and i hear it all the times in the room and it's so true for me you know and and about i think it's about 5 years ago i changed my sponsor you know and 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 i got a new sponsor and it was a male sponsor you know i've been in recovery quite quite a number of years and like he said to me, like, Karen, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, I don't really know, really. Like, he was like, well, what's your dreams? You know, what's your dreams? Because anything is possible here. You know, if you land in a helicopter outside anyone's house on this meeting, I guarantee you, you'd get it off the ground. Because alcoholics have this drive in them, this absolutely resilience and this you know, we are really smart people, you know, that are just so versatile in, in so many different areas of my in our lives, you know. And I, by this time I've been, you know, I had a flat, I had a little job, I had a car, you know, still no relationship. And I was like, you know, God saved me from that one. I'm five, you know, there's five years, no relationship, because I thought I needed a man, obviously, because there's something wrong with me, because if you love me, then I'm worthy of it, you know. And um, and I wrote a list of my dreams. And this is what was the reconstruction for me, you know, and really like doing things for myself. And and I wrote and and my sponsor said, even if you don't believe them, because what what alcoholism done was, you know, I never became a mother. That was a massive thing for me when I came in. I never became a mother, so I felt I, I felt inadequate as a woman. I thought you can't even become a mother. That's how useless you are. You know, you see all these, you know, and this was the belief system I had, which is not true. I'm quite delighted today, even though I have a niece that is with me like nearly all of the time, you know, and we're so close, you know, and, and I love her like she was and she, like she was my daughter, like she's a daughter. And uh and you know, do you want to get married? what you want to do and one of the things that i put on the list was was my education you know and um i went to a university in london and i said uh this is me i've got no education you know because i learned how to talk here you know because i dealt with my side of the street here and i cleared the wreckage of my past and i had my higher power i had my trump card in my back pocket I went in that university and I had my AA trump card. I could pull it out any time. And I've got the language of the heart. I've got a way to connect with people that other people haven't got what we've got here. This is a gift. People don't, you know, this is like the most exclusive club in the world that you don't even have to pay to get into, you know. And it is, and, and you know, I was able to go in there. So this is me. And, um and they said, come in, you want to learn? Come into the university. Next thing I know, I'm sitting on a room, sitting in a chair in a room at a university, thinking, how did I get here? How did I go from living in a homeless hostel in Harlesden, on probation, in trouble with the police, not washing, not looking after myself, from being in recovery, you know, having a bit of dignity meet for myself, believing in myself, starting to build my life back together to walk in and say, this is me, you know, and, and I sat in the class and the teacher came out and said, I'd like you all to say something about yourself. And like I said, hi, so, you know, it went round and it came to me. I said, hi, I'm Karen. I'm terrified. You know, I've got no education. You know, it was a lot. I've gone into a very middle class profession. You know, I said, I'm working class. You know, you're all going to judge me. I'm judging you. And everyone was sitting there like that. Because they don't have the capacity to be honest like us, that that we are able to look at ourselves. And it went round and there's a guy in my class whose name's Charles and he's a lawyer. And, Char and he said, my name's Charles and I'm a lawyer. 
And before I speak, he said, Karen, he said, it really moved me. He said, um, you might not be academic. He said, but I don't know where you've learned to talk. And in my head, it's because I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's where I've learned to talk because I've learned to believe in myself. I've learned that I don't need to drink one day at a time. That what I do is I clean house, you know, go to meetings and I help others. And that's what I do. I stay close to my higher power. I cannot do this without God. I cannot do this. I don't want to be away from Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't come here to see who's on the meeting or what I'm doing. I come here because I want to be here. I came here because I want to fulfill my primary purpose, which is to stay sober and help another alcoholic, you know, and my life has changed dramatically. So I'm coming to the end of my share now, you know, and it's, it's not all rainbows and hot pants. Do you know what I mean? I'm not rolling skating down the road with Carly Minogue's hot pants with a lollipop in my mouth going, this is great. I thought I'd meet John, George Clooney, you know, going off into the sunset, you know, get married, all my hair going in the wind because fantasy was one of my things. Like, you know, someone would come and save me. You know, Walt Disney should be shot because there's no ivory castle for me to be on, you know, and, I, and I've had hard times. I got run over in recovery. You know, I lost my spleen. I fractured my shoulder. I had my heart broken. There's no chapter in the big book, how to get over your heart being broken by somebody, then goes off and marries somebody else. I had to deal with that without picking up a drink. I've had to deal with bereavement. I've had to deal with falling out with friends in the fellowship. I've had to deal with people, places and things. You know, I work for the NHS. I've got a difficult relationship with my boss. I have to deal with him. I'm not running away today. I'm not running away to a drink. I'm not running away to a drug house. I'm not r- running off with someone's husband. I've got respect for myself. It's not all gr- It's not all every day is a brilliant day, but I now have a program of recovery. I now have a belief in myself. You know, so if you're new to this fellowship, don't sell yourself short by not doing the steps. Don't sell yourself short and listen to your head tell you, you don't need this. Because I can't live without it. And I don't want to live without it because I come here and I learn how to be a better woman. I learn that my weight doesn't define me. How I look doesn't define me. I don't need to pump loads of stuff in my face and my body. And if you do, great. I mean, I might do in five years time. Who knows? I don't need to. I can just be me. You know, I've got a man in my life that respects me, that I'm not holding his his legs as he's going out the door begging him, you know, I've got a loving relationship where he can go off to conventions to his friends and I can trust him. And I go off, I'm going to Croatia in June and I can go off with my friends and I've learned that I can trust. And I I came from a household that you couldn't trust. So if you're new to AA, please, you know, keep coming back or stay, you know, get yourself a sponsor, do all the stuff I rolled my eyes at, you know, and um, you're surely you know, go off into the de- happy destiny, like, like you know, and and thank you, everybody, and thank you for listening to me. And, yep, yeah, I've got four minutes left, so I hope that's enough. So thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.